mother of all global environmental issues that we have bearing down on us right now. I started my work in renewable energy uh, at teaching at the university in 1973 and never looked back. I'm a physicist by training, a nuclear physicist by background. But renewable energy was clearly the direction to go and I clearly loved it. And uh, so my interest grew out of that and when you're interested in renewable energy uh, and, and an awareness of the related environmental issues that renewable energy addresses uh, certainly comes along with it. So I've been deeply involved also in, in climate change and global warming. People call it global warming because it's known as global warming and there will be some warming, but climate change is really the issue. And I've been, uh, last 20 years I'd say in those, and over 30 years in renewable energy. Well, let's say you're, in a, you're running for president on the renewable energy ticket and mm -hmm. uh, you're in a, a debate, one of those idiotic debates they have on television, you know, and you're trying to convince George Bush in three minutes that global warming or global climate change is mm -hmm. a problem. It's serious. What would you say to him? Well, a, a way to address it is to start putting it into economic terms. Um, from the scientific standpoint, the global atmospheric scientists and climate scientists, there's overwhelming unanimity now. Uh, the last statement signed by 2,000 of them, that not only uh, are the greenhouse gases contributing to a change, global warming and to climate change, but that now the dominant um, aspect of that, the dominant part of that, is human-induced. So there's no scientific question as to what's going on. The scientific questions revolve around what's going to happen. And the Earth has is, is, is showed a remarkable consistency of climate and temperature with CO2 in the atmosphere for at least 450,000 years. We have fossil remains for at least 450,000 years. Scientifically, there's no reason to expect the Earth to suddenly start behaving differently from what it has in the past. But there's a major difference. And that is, if we look at the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere, for example, it's gone up as a spike. It's more than the Earth has seen in the last 450,000 years. And instead of taking the usual 5,000 or 10,000 years to sort of make these grand global changes, it's happened in 50 years. So there's a remarkable difference. We have more CO2, more greenhouse gases in a shorter time inflicted upon the Earth. And it makes it difficult to unequivocally say this is precisely what the Earth is going to do and this is the time scale. There's no question we're going to get warmer, and the average of all of the models is about three degrees warmer. So coming back to George Bush, or coming back to our own governor, people will say three degrees warmer, so what? You can just turn up your air conditioners. Well, if we become three degrees centigrade warmer, about five degrees Fahrenheit warmer, the snow level in the Sierra goes up 1,500 feet. And so 70% of the water that's caught in the winter now for snow will stop being caught our snowpack accumulation will reduce by 70%. Our rains will, instead of accumulating the snow, which becomes our summer water for irrigation, it'll just go off, which increases the winter floods. Then you get to summer and you don't have enough water for the California rivers. That'll bankrupt the California agricultural industry, and that's 18 or $19 billion industry right there. And you can go up the Pacific Northwest and notice how they depend economically on logging. And a three degree rise, ecosystems have to walk north 500 miles or they have to walk vertically 1,500 feet. And so you get these huge ecological perturbations that are very quickly reduced to huge economic losses. His brother, the president's brother, is, is governor of Florida. Florida will lose all of its seashore land, which is the source of its uh, primary economic uh, activity. All of the Everglades will go underwater. Florida will be the state with the greatest single immediate economic impact, much as many of the low-lying islands and Bangladesh and other low-lying countries in the world. This is a real problem. It's a real issue. It's not fantasy. It's really happening, and it is avoidable. The rest of the world, and, and the European Union in particular, uh, certainly doesn't question the science. No reputable scientist questioned the science anymore. And the only ones who are still questioning it are still those who are being paid for their research by the coal industry. So that's not an issue. The European Union, for example, is responding very, very strongly, recognizing not only the potential impact upon their own countries by simply allowing the um, climate change issue to go unchecked. For example, uh, Northern Europe and England would freeze 
if we get warmer because the Gulf, the whole stream that carries all the warm waters, if you will, up what they call the Grand Conveyor Belt uh, has stopped many times in the past. And if it stops again, it doesn't take much warming at all. Uh, Europe will become much, much colder as a result. So they have serious climate issues to face. And, uh, but they also are aware of the benefits. And they don't want to keep spending their energy dollars out of Europe. They want to bring the jobs and the energy dollars in. And they realize when you go to renewable energy resources, you're going to indigenous, locally available resources. And so there's huge um, economic development going on right now. Germany gets 5% of its electricity from wind and 30% from nuclear, yet they employ as many people in the wind industry as they do in the nuclear industry already. And so Europe is capitalizing both on wanting to avoid potential problems, it'll be extremely costly and difficult, and on wanting to really gain economic strength by being the first ones uh, up front for the solutions. Could you say a little bit about how the conveyor, so-called conveyor <laughs> belt works? Just to, you know, to... there's a grand there's a grand ocean energy thermal energy conveyor belt that um, brings energy, warm energy, if you will, from the warmer climates, and it carries it up northward. For example, the reason that 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 Canada and the Pacific Northwest are so warm is this northward carrying of um, warm of warmth from the tropical regions. And then, as the water cools up northward, it sinks and it goes down deep. And as it goes deep, it drives a return loop. And part of that loop also goes up past Africa and past um, Europe, and then comes down by Scandinavia and back out. And what drives that loop is also that the water sinks down, and that's driven very sensitively by the ratio uh, relationship of salt water to fresh water. And as we have more glacial melt, for example, up there, um, as we have more rainfall, it'll disturb the balance, the fresh water and the salt water balance, and they've shown very recently that it won't take much of a disturbance to break that return flow. And the moment the return flow is broken, in other words, the water doesn't sink, it remains too buoyant, so it can't sink. So the whole process stops. And if it stops, you're no longer bringing that wonderful warm water up by Europe and Scandinavia. And it just sits there and gets cold. So that's really how it works. And that's, that's a potentially huge impact on the industrial nations of the world. Do, um, and doesn't it go by the um, Atlantic Northeast um, states of the mm -hmm. United States? Absolutely, yeah. It, comes, it loops up around and comes back down. And so if you look at our seashore areas, the, the, the ocean itself, of course, has thermal mass and tends to keep things warmer. But artificially, we're pumping energy in California, too. I mean, we've got this warm Pacific water going right by us, going from south to north right by us. It's deep. Climate change and the impact on societies and the number of people who will die from it and the costs to human health uh, is far greater with climate change than worldwide terrorism. Terrorism is awful, and it's killing people by the tens and by the hundreds. Climate change will displace people by the hundreds of millions, and it will kill them by the hundreds of thousands and millions. It will displace economies and impact economies at a far more serious uh, amount than the impact that we're having from the fear of terrorism. And I'm not denigrating the, 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 the fear of terrorism and the problems it causes. But by looking at terrorism and turning our back on this far greater problem, the, the Pentagon article demonstrated that what happens is when you begin to have serious climate changes and you no longer can grow food for the developing nations and you have floods and people are being dislocated, it leads to enormous international tensions which is going to exacerbate and cause wars. And that's the, the result of that. And wars kill people far greater numbers than um, terrorism is doing it. And wars caused by climate change and loss of resources and displaced people uh, is a thing of our past history. We have hundreds of years of that kind of wars. We've always fought wars. And it won't take much to start doing it again. That was the fear of the Pentagon, Pentagon paper. The silliest thing that we do is to try to figure out how much longer the oil will last and how much longer the natural gas will last. Um, we don't know. Maybe we're going to run into serious problems before the decade is over. Maybe we can make it to 2025 or 2035. 
What's so silly is that such a short time scale? It, it's it's just 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 the, the time of our children becoming adults and and going to work. Um, the evidence increasingly and in very recent papers is that all of the estimations of the amount of oil that's available have been seriously overestimated. Shell Oil themselves just announced, we're sorry folks, we've overestimated by 20%, we're backing all our estimates down by 20%, but the biggest problem we're facing is Saudi Arabia, which is still telling people that they can do 10 million barrels of oil a day until 2050, and they can do 40 million barrels a day by 2025. And there's no scientific evidence to back that. And in fact, the scientific evidence in very recent papers coming out is that the Saudi oil fields that they have are the ones that are now being developed. They've already reached their peak, and Saudi Arabia will start going over its peak rather soon. So what I believe to be the, the, the technically valid information is that the world will reach peak oil production uh, I say around 2015 by simply putting everything together that I've read. But much more important than that is when the demand will exceed the ability to produce. Even if we reach peak oil production, the demand is going up faster than the production. And that immediately changes the whole thing from a buyer's market to a seller's market. And the prices will go up dramatically. There will be international competition for, by the people who can pay for the oil, uh, competition for the, by the people who cannot pay for it. Here comes your, your, your potential wars again over resources. And I believe before this decade is over that we're going to see that buyers and sellers market change dramatically. It's going to pull along the natural gas costs and all of the energy costs. And that will change the economics of oil for all time. That's why this whole argument about whether there's more oil and more natural gas to be found is silly. Natural gas we don't have uh, really any more we can develop in this country. So we said, we'll import it from Canada. All of our utilities in the country are planning new natural gas power plants. Canada announced recently, forget it, guys. We only have enough natural gas to keep up with our own demand, and we're not going to send any more to you guys than you're already getting. Two-fifths of the world natural gas is in, is in um, the uh, Middle East, and one-fifth of the world's natural gas is in Russia. And so here we go again. If we phased a natural gas, we're still importing this stuff. We've got these liquefied tanks. They're wonderful targets for terrorists. The, the whole policy of continuing with oil and natural gas is just a silly, dangerous, uneconomic, and unsupportable policy. So the time for change really is now. And now we address the other issue, can we change? And yes, we can. The world has plenty of resources that are available within what we call the solar budget, the amount of energy that naturally comes into the Earth. I have just completed a white paper that was funded by the European Union called Transitioning to a Renewable Energy Future, which essentially demonstrates that we have the resources worldwide, we have the economic opportunity worldwide, and we must start taking it seriously. And if we do, an energy transition takes about 60 years, and how do I know? The United States has done it twice before. The United States uh, was largely wood-powered into the 1800s. And then we phased from wood to coal, and it took about 60 years to use the energy from wood to make the devices that allowed us to use coal and so on. And then oil and natural gas began to be uh, of interest to us. And we took about 60 years to phase from our dominant use of coal. We still have a major use of coal for electricity. But from our dominant use of coal to a dominant use of oil and natural gas, it took another 60 years. It's about how long it takes. And it can be done very economically and gradually and using the energy from the resources we now have, the gift of oil and natural gas and coal that we now have. Use the energy from those to make the devices and the opportunities that will allow us to do the transition. Wouldn't it be shorter since uh, we don't have to build quite the bulky um, plants that it seems like the renewable energy um, methods don't require quite the, the same kind of infrastructure. They, they don't. I mean, not only do they use locally, ener locally available energy resources, but they tend then to be local um, facilities. In the case of solar electric, which is very popular right now, you put it on your buildings and your homes, and generally you have enough rooftops for the kind of solar climate we have here to power the electricity of a city just off of rooftops, and it's right there. You don't build big central things that the terrorists can blow up and big things that require new infrastructure. Now you do in the case where you have wind farms, 
but wind farms tend to be reasonably close to urban areas, the ones that we can develop. And uh, biomass opportunities and wind farms provide a lot of money for farmers. They're boons to the rural economy and the farm economy of the Midwestern United States. And all of these are boons to the local economies. And then we haven't talked about efficiency, and it'll really be a mistake if I don't talk about it. Because the way we will be able to affect a renewable energy transition is to use our energy as efficiently as we can as well. If we try to keep using it with what I might call SUV equivalents, you won't be able to make the transition. Then there's just going to be total, complete economic chaos. But as we transition from SUVs, I drove a GM EV1 until they took it back. We now drive a Toyota Prius, 50 miles a gallon, great car. That's one thing you can do, this little place where we're, um, I'm being interviewed is a small place to live, very energy efficient, appliances, lights, everything is efficient. We can walk, take mass transit, life is efficient. There's so much that we can do ourselves that can make it easier and less expensive and much quicker to affect the renewable energy transition. So we have to do these things together. People, when they think of, of renewable energy, they generally just talk about solar, and I'll come back to that because it's the dominant one. But we have a gift of geothermal energy, for example, in the western U.S. The capacity of the geothermal energy is theoretically available as 14 times the energy of all the coal in the United States. We've got that in the western U.S. We have um, solar energy that can appear in other ways. You evaporate water and it comes down as rivers and you have hydro energy, although the big rivers have not been tapped out. We have solar energy in ways where it grows plants and it grows trees and it makes woody crops and so on. And when we cut these up and chip them or grow them specifically to, to burn or turn into fuels, we call those generically biomass crops. And that's converting solar energy to fuels and converting it to electricity. And then we have the direct use of solar energy and in all buildings that ought to be used directly. The windows right behind you, one reason we took this little place is they face to you south. And so we're wonderfully warm naturally right here in the Bay Area, and in most places of the U.S. you can be, by just having south-facing windows and energy-efficient shells on your, on your home and designing the interior carefully. With commercial buildings, we use the solar energy for the light. For daylight, it comes in as light, after all. <clears throat> and so we light our buildings with daylighting, and we can get rid of almost all of the electric lighting in, in our buildings. That's solar energy use. And then, of course, we can make use it for heat, not only for heating our homes, but for heating water, heating hot water. And we can use that for our domestic water heating, but we can also use that for our radiant floor space heating. Major conversion of a building in San Francisco just the last couple of years um, is using solar radiant heating, a huge conversion. 1976, I designed a library for San Jose State University that used solar heating for its only heating resource. So one can do that in big ways. And then one can use, of course, solar to make electricity. And that's the glamorous thing that everybody relates to these days because electricity intersects our lives in so many important ways. And the wonderful thing about that is it's available everywhere. It really is. And it times itself very well to the utility needs. There's a house not far from here that's put solar on the roof. It used three-eighths of its roof for the solar panels. And that creates enough electricity for the house and both of its electric cars. So that says that the solar energy falling on three-eighths of the roof can drive two cars and power a house. In this climate, if you get to a climate with not so much sun, maybe it would take half the roof or three-quarters of the roof. But the point is, it's a resource that's available. And in fact, the solar energy resource, the radiation coming down, is uniformly available by a factor of only two throughout the United States. Seattle, Washington has got 60% as much as we do. It doesn't, this isn't something that's ten times greater. So when you take all these resources, geothermal and biomass, and I didn't even mention wind, which again is a form of solar energy, it's just the differential heating of the ground that causes the air to move from high to low pressure. That's carrying solar energy also. And the, the, the energy density and potential of that is extraordinary, extraordinary. And if you look at each of these resources I mentioned, each in theory could power the United States. Now in practice, if if you have the wind concentrated in areas, for example, people will often say that the Dakotas could provide enough electricity for the United States, but you're not talking about taking transmission lines throughout the country. You're talking about putting these wind generators closer to where the people live. So we will tap into the resources that are available to us, 
Every state in the Union has one of those major resources that I mentioned to you in abundance. There are some states like California and Nevada and Oregon and Kansas and Hawaii that have got all four. No, not Kansas. I'm sorry, it doesn't have geothermal. It's got three of the four. But there are some that have got all four of them. Piece of cake to do an energy transition. Those states I just mentioned can all be energy exporters except for Hawaii because of where it is. But Hawaii is still importing its own oil, which is just foolish. It can use its geothermal energy to make hydrogen and run its cars. And, and there's just so much that they can do. So the resources are here in great abundance. The technologies are fully developed now. We're not waiting for new technologies. We will be able to improve upon the technologies we have. But they're fully developed now for complete commercial use. Develop of multi, multi-billion dollar industries. There are practical realities when you come into cities as you've got buildings close together, the roofs don't all face the same direction, the way the infrastructure is built. Um, you don't just slap PV on all the roofs and say, okay, we're done with the city. On the other hand, there's enormous potential within cities by the cities that go and find it. The great example in this area for the last 10 years has been Sacramento and the Sacramento Municipal Utility District. And I've often said in the national and international talks I give that if SMUD didn't exist, I wouldn't have much to talk about. And SMUD simply said, we're going to close our nuclear power plant because we're throwing bad, good money after bad. It's a real economic dog. We're losing 800 megawatts of power and we do that. We're losing 25% of our electricity. We're going to have to buy electricity from out of the city and our rates are going to go up. But stand by everybody. David Freeman said this, their administrator. Stand by because within three years we're going to be the nation's leading solar, electric, and renewable energy utility and the prices will come down. And this is now eight years later after, since they've embarked on that. And SMUD is the world's leading solar city and solar utility. And the prices and utility prices are right back down to where they would have been if they had never changed. You sort of bite the bullet, you get over the hurdle and you find you have huge opportunities. SMUD is still having to, to make a lot of electricity by conventional methods and import electricity, but it is in the process of the transition. Now what's terribly exciting is here we have San Francisco that said, SMUD, that's very nice, we're going to do 10 times better than you guys, and we don't have quite the sun you do, but don't worry, we can still do 10 times better at least. And the courage of the city of San Francisco is remarkable. And what's helped it is to discover that the famous fog that comes in San Francisco doesn't go uniformly throughout the city. And there are pockets of sunny areas even when it's foggy. And it's not foggy all the time. And there's energy that even comes through the fog. You can still make electricity even through the fog. And San Francisco's $100 million Proposition H bond issue is absolutely worldwide pioneering. And the next thing they're doing that's equally pioneering is saying, now let's set the legislative basis by which we can write our own rules, not becoming a municipal utility like SMUD, but becoming something in between where we can write our own rules, our own contract to buy our electricity from whomever we want to buy it. And we can set our rules so that we can require that there's more renewable energy in that electricity mix. PG&E will still operate the infrastructure and so on. And then we can fold our Proposition H money into that and use other city money. They have very clever ways of zero net cost ways of combining efficiency and renewables in San Francisco. And we can, we can do those programs as well if we take control of our own energy future through the community aggregation uh, ordinance that is, is before them. And if San Francisco does that, that will set an example for the world, combining resource availability, courage, locally funded bonds, um, local control of energy supply, and local control of setting their own energy rules. Terribly exciting. I'm delighted. Uh, I have to admit that I'm very bothered by the amount of talk about hydrogen right now and the money and effort being put into it. There's no question we will have a hydrogen economy in the future. No question. There's no question that hydrogen is greatly valuable as a means for taking intermittent resources like solar energy and wind and so on, converting it into fuels that we can use in vehicles and that we can use uh, on our own time scale. There's an awful lot to be said about that. But the fact is that we will save more energy for the next 20 years, more fuel, in just hybrid standard vehicles that are hybrid vehicles like the Toyota Prius that I drive 
for 20 years before hydrogen can really begin to make a dent in vehicles. And uh, so it, it, it's much more important to be promoting vehicle efficiency right now and putting our money into gaining that vehicle efficiency than it is putting into our money into new motive things that the President of the United States has said that he doesn't expect hydrogen vehicles for the next 10 years, but we really want to put that money into them. Well, it won't be 10 years. It'll be more like 20 years, perhaps, before it's really we have a developed infrastructure. And unfortunately, I mean, there's an awful lot that has to happen before we can have a hydrogen highway, before we can have hydrogen pipelines. No, we can't use our regular gas pipelines. They leak if you put hydrogen in them. It takes a whole new infrastructure. And the big difference between natural gas and hydrogen is natural gas is available and hydrogen isn't. You've got to make it. It takes energy to make hydrogen. And so all of the plans right now are either to use natural gas or gasoline in automobiles and to draw the hydrogen out of that to power the um, fuel cells in the autos, in which case you make just as much CO2 as you ever did. It turns out if you, if you took natural gas and put it directly into a car and drove the car in natural gas, you'd get four times the miles from it than if you use natural gas to make hydrogen into a fuel cell. I mean, that's why it's so silly. Eventually it'll be important, but it's silly now. Um, they're talking about new nuclear plants to make hydrogen. I mean, what have you done with, with our whole energy policy and the money that we put into energy if we do that? It's very valuable if we make hydrogen from renewable resources. As I said, it can level the intermittency of solar and wind and so on, and we can do that. And the hydrogen economy will really make sense when we're making that hydrogen with renewables, which means we have to have a fully developed renewable infrastructure and economy in place or going into place before the hydrogen economy. They're turning it completely around right now, backwards. And they can simply exacerbate the problems we're having with fossil fuels and nuclear by continuing to turn it around backwards. And they can continue to decrease the efficiency of our use of energy by putting hydrogen up front. So that's my caution about it. <laughs> well said. <laughs> yeah. Well said. What about tidal energy, particularly? In, and there's some fantasies about using the tidal energy that comes through the gate and so on. Is that well, the that tidal current? I, I didn't. When I mentioned the renewable resources before, there are there are several others I didn't mention. There's tidal energy and there's wave energy and there are others that are locally available and in theory can be tapped. Tidal energy is already being tapped in France and has been for the last 30 years. They have a tidal power plant. And we are going to put one in the U.S. up in, in Maine. And we have uh, Passamaquoddy Bay is perfect. And the water comes rushing in. It's close to uh, Nova Scotia where they have the huge tides. And uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt actually uh, dedicated. And then the, the war came in. They decided not to do it. And then after the war, long after the war, Maine built a nuclear plant instead of the tidal plant. And now Maine has had to shut down the nuclear plant because it doesn't work and it's too expensive. You can see what, what happens with these circles. Tidal energy, when you use it with the water going up and down, is just hydro energy. But you need it where you have very high tides, and we don't here. You have 40-foot tides out there and 6-foot tides or 8-foot tides here. But you have tidal currents. And you can tap into those currents with quite benign things that can go rather deep. Because the, the currents come in, the tide comes in on the surface through the Golden Gate and then goes out deep. And so you can go down deep and you can capture these water flows and quite possibly have a significant energy density that would not interfere with ecology or with shipping or anything of that sort. It simply shows the value of looking for your resources. We have geothermal energy just north of San Francisco. And the geysers area is already making as much energy as the whole city of San Francisco uses. It's not all going to San Francisco, but the point is that's another locally available resource. So San Francisco is blessed with locally available resources. Large-scale wind is problematic because of the environmental aspects of building big turbines right along the, the coast. We could do offshore wind very nicely, and we can bring wind just from Sonoma, just bring it in. But, but uh, windmills kill raptors and birds. Oh, one of the, uh, another very seriously overrated problem that bothers me a lot is this business of wind turbines killing birds. We had the misfortune of building the first wind turbines in the world, really the first wind farms in the world, were built in Alderman Pass. And they're little wind turbines, little ones, where the blades spin around really fast. They're close to the ground, and Alderman Pass is the Pacific flyway for the migratory birds. So the migratory birds come by and they slope soar there. 
and then they see gophers and, and they, they stop and they land on the towers and they get chewed up by the propellers when they're going to get to eat rodents. It was the worst possible place to build them and the worst technology to put there. Everything is different now. In the first place, the turbines are giant. Instead of 100 kilowatts, they're up to 5,000 kilowatts, 5 megawatt ones. 50 times bigger, huge turbines. When you have the big turbines, the blades go around as I'm showing, I'll put it here so I can get into the TV, as I'm showing with my finger. That's how fast the blades go. It takes four, three to five seconds for the blades to go. Easy for birds to see. Birds aren't being killed by the, the, the new big turbines. And they've gotten smart, and the turbines are now being made with round towers. All the lines are being put underground and in the towers, so there's no place for the, for the birds to even to land. The birds used to land on the towers and then fly through the blades. Now there's no place for them to land. And then I look at all of the birds that were killed in Altamont Pass. And then you compare that with, say, the number of migratory birds that were killed when the Exxon Valdez went down. 500,000 times as many birds died from the Exxon Valdez as from all of the ones that were being killed in Altamont Pass. Um, we get something like, and I'm forgetting my numbers right now, but of the order of 500,000 to a million migratory birds are killed each year just by power lines, which is hundreds of times as many birds are killed um, by wind turbines. And people are not saying, take all the power lines down. We can't. It's infrastructure. We need it. It's up. But they don't realize we need wind turbines. It turns out there's no way of making energy, even with renewable energy, that doesn't have environmental impact. It's just much, much lower than all of the conventional ways. We kill millions of migratory birds each year with cars by running into them. People are saying, not telling us to get rid of the cars, right? It's a terribly overblown problem, and technically they really have it licked. So talk about the relationship between this transition to solar economy and, uh, and democracy and environmental justice and things like that. You said in the news conference the other day that, uh, you know, you, you framed it in terms of people power, so what yes. power is really people power, so talk yeah. more about that. Well, one of the great benefits of um, putting more of our effort and our money into renewable energy is partly because we're putting it into local industries, local jobs, uh, people who themselves have got uh, influence in, in the availability of, of the energy resources, and it puts it under the jurisdiction of local governments, like San Francisco and like Sacramento, for example. And when it's under the jurisdiction of local governments, they can be very courageous. They can take control of their energy futures and really accelerate the transition. And they can accelerate the transition like San Francisco is doing in ways that really benefit the local economy. So San Francisco will have more jobs created by this. Thousands of new jobs will be created by this. So the local jurisdictions can come in, they can take control of their energy futures, they can reap the benefits of it, and all of that accelerates the renewable energy transition faster, really, than if just central government does it. But we really do need central government authority to come in as well, because it levels the playing field for everyone, and it can set, like the European Union, has set conditions by which every member of the Union has got to be up to 12% of their energy produced by renewables by 2010 or 2012. When central government sets those rules, that also adds a, a, a security to the financial community mm -hmm. that they're going to have big business and they're going to be more liable and willing than to put their money into the local businesses because of that federal incentive and securities that come in. But isn't it a gamble because like if our, our incipient enemies like China, you know, do coal and and, and uh, other takeover oil fields and stuff, won't we be endangering national security to take the risk of being the first with the most uh, in energy transition? And stuff? No, it, 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 it turns out that, that continuing use of fossil fuels is extraordinarily dangerous from a, a world security uh, standpoint. I actually have no idea why the terrorists aren't going around blowing up power plants and power lines right now. It's easy to do. And they will. They will. And when we rely on a lot of energy coming from large power plants going through large power lines, it's very easy to cripple a society. We saw what happened with the power blackout we had last October, last August uh, in uh, 
the United States, and it was followed one month later where the whole country of Italy went down. What we have to do in order to increase security is to go away from what can be the convenient targets for terrorists who can really cripple society with just a few bombs. And by going to smaller and more local and many more generation opportunities and local generation opportunities and an infrastructure that's sort of built in that's part of the city, what are terrorists going to do? You know, after San Francisco puts in their wonderful solar program, are the terrorists going to come in and blow up all the roofs? You know, I mean, it, 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 it really provides an insulation from an extraordinary exposure, and I think it's the most underrated terrorist exposure we have in this country right now, is uh, our entire energy infrastructure. We've talked about importing natural gas. We'll import it as liquefied natural gas. You'll have those big spherical containers. Boy, one bomb, boom, there goes your natural gas. It, it's, we have to get away from the central facilities. So as the United States goes toward renewable energy and decentralized facilities, we will be enhancing our security dramatically, dramatically, compared to the other countries. And the European Union recognizes that also. That's part of their policy. We should talk about the incentives a little bit, because people are wondering why do we have to incentivize a new um, industry like the renewable energy industries, and they're forgetting how much we incentivize the existing industries. For every dollar you spend for gasoline at the pump right now, you just spend another dollar through your taxes, but you didn't know that. So if gasoline is $2 a, a, a gallon, you're paying $4 a gallon right now. You already are, but you don't see it out front, and so you don't realize the true costs. How does that work? Well, for oil depletion allowances, for all of the other uh, incentives that go, and you better not ask me to include the defense, because at least a quarter of our defense budget goes to protect our access to oil fields, in which case I probably just multiplied the cost of gasoline by a factor of four. And all of those are coming out of our taxes. And we incentivize directly nuclear power, for example, 25 years after it was first introduced was still getting more tax dollars per kilowatt hour than wind electric is getting. Today, I mean, nuclear power in, in the present budget right now, there is more money for research into nuclear power than there is into the renewables. I mean, there's still enormous incentives, billions of dollars of incentives going into the existing energy resources. And so people talk about leveling the playing field. One way is snap our fingers and reduce all the incentives. And you can imagine the squawks and squeals and yells of pain we get on that one. So the other one is providing incentives to the renewables, which is just trying to equalize. That's all we're trying to do with the incentives. And then it makes a lot of sense to incentivize something that creates local jobs, because then the local jobs also enhance the local economy. So you, the state of Wisconsin did a remarkable study showing that if they use locally available renewable energy resources instead of importing electricity or importing resources to make electricity. It adds two and a half cents a kilowatt hour to the treasury. It's a plus. So Wisconsin can turn around and do it with the renewables at only about one and a half cents a kilowatt hour more, and they still end up with one cent per kilowatt hour as a net plus to the treasury. And that's when you start doing your macroeconomics, do your economics beyond the cost of just energy, and realize that the way we spend our money for energy is just as important as the amount of money we spend for the energy. And the way we spend it hires people. Okay? The utilities spend the greatest amount of money per job of any sector in the United States. So spending more money for utilities doesn't produce many new jobs. Nuclear is the worst of all of them. Spending money for the renewables, where you get multipliers, major multipliers, you're taking the money that you used to spend for fuel and now you're spending it for people. When you spend it for people, people respend that money and they prime the local economy. Well, that's worth money. We, we've got chambers of commerce that are trying to get conventions in San Francisco because the tourists come in and the convention people spend a lot of money. Well, also spending some San Francisco money, for example, to support renewables is also a way of enhancing the economy in the same way, in the same way. People just aren't aware of how heavily we're subsidizing the conventional resources and how much each of us is really paying more than we think we're paying for the conventional resources. C conventional resources are what? Gas, oil, coal, things of that sort. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's such a, um, especially now when they're, oh, we've got to cut 
human services and education and uh, music and art and oh my gosh. <laughs> and, Close and the for libraries. The, for the military, for the military budget. It's just awful. I mean, the, the people, the, the, there's an, what's called the Apollo Project is being seriously proposed right now, which is aimed at accelerating the renewable energy transition for the world. And they're figuring the expenditure would be of the order of $30 billion a year. It's major. $30 billion a year is one-seventh of our, no, excuse me, it's one-tenth of our defense budget. And this would be for a highly excelled rate with, of, of uh, transition to renewables with enormous offsetting economic benefits. So you, we, we, we really, our priorities are just remarkably skewed I could say it other ways too. <laughs> you get the drift. <laughs> so, anything on these topics that you, we haven't said? I think people, if if they really began to hear the message and began to gain the confidence, this is what they don't have. People will say that well, solar energy is fine, but oh, it's not really ready yet. It's terribly expensive. All of that kind of stuff. If we could just give them enough information, so they could gain the confidence. And part of that confidence will come from programs like San Francisco, where you begin to get rooftops with renewable energy, with solar electric, and where they begin to import energy from renewables. And people begin to see major cities that are turning to these realistic resources. Then the confidence will come. So those city policies are incredibly important, but we're really lagging terribly behind in just public education. Every time I give a public talk, I am asked, oh, God, if we could only videotape this and get it out to everybody, fine. But how do you get them out? It, 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 we're, we're just not doing it. You are now, and I appreciate the fact you're here and, and you're helping. Well, we, um, thank you. And one more thing, um, it, and this is relating what it could be um, to, in contrast to what the state suffered through the, the energy crisis where we were bilked and nobody's even um, articulating that straight on. That was awful. Oh. I, I was uh, employed with the Union of Concerned Scientists uh, during the period that we were having our, our crisis. And I was the official intervener. Uh, we have 13,000 Union of Concerned Scientists um, sponsors in the state. So I was legally, officially the intervener for our 13,000 members in all of this. So I was up to my ears in it. Making testimony starting in 1974, April 74, when the PUC first put the restructuring on the, on the table. And in the course of developing the testimony, we were able to, to identify early on all of the loopholes that were being handed to the utilities. And we have testimony on record telling the Peace Commission, for example, of all of the loopholes and of the dangers. And we were just dismissed, just dismissed. And it was transparently obvious that if they put that program in place, which they did, companies would jump through the loopholes because companies operate in their self-interest, and they did. So when we suddenly had the energy shortage, a lot of us knew that we weren't short. We were never short of energy. And the last thing in the world we should have done is to go buy more energy. Okay, the immediate thing would be to, to, to get the courts to issue injunctions to the power plants to turn on those 70 power plants that were turned off, oh, simultaneously, somehow because all their chimneys had to be cleaned at once, all right? And all of these ridiculous things they did. If we had turned to the courts immediately and had gotten the power dumped back into the system, and if we had really played hardball economics with the providers of energy, we could have come out the other side quite quickly without all the contracts. We, certainly we would have needed temporary contracts just to help us through. But it got ridiculous. And writing the long-term contracts that we did was wholly indefensible. Indefensible. And we are all paying now for contracts that we never needed and should never have written. The Governor Davis was terribly excited because he said we have 16 new power plants under construction. If we do it right with efficiency, we don't need those new power plants even that are being built. We may get some value from some of them, but if we really put our effort into efficiency and renewables, we don't even need those. So the economics have been terribly mishandled in such a way that's creating an economic legacy. Fifteen billion dollar bond issue right now goes to our kids. It's, 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 it's scary and I, it, I was so saddened because we had an administration I thought that was more enlightened than that. And we had David Freeman who, are, who was the architect of the SMUD program, who was the chief advisor. And he got it all wrong. 
And you don't tell David that because he doesn't like to be told he's wrong. But they really did. They panicked. And so another reason why we've got to stay ahead of the curve is that if, if things don't go right and if power plants are blown up or, you know, we have the collusion, the market collusion, people panic. And when we panic, we behave extremely badly. We simply have to avoid setting the framework for panic. Everything we're doing with our energy policy now is setting the framework for panic. It really is. And it's completely avoidable. Now, what about scale? I mean, it's, it's all very nice for all these little cities to go and have their, you know, their renewable portfolios, but is that really going to impact the global problems? Don't we really need a top-down federal policy or international policy? And is local effort really useful, or is it just symbolic <coughs> and kind of uh, consciousness, conscious mm -hmm. saving, you know? You're asking a very good question. The question you're asking is the importance of local efforts versus top-down, bottom-up versus top-down. They're both equally important. If we look toward the European Union and the standards that they have set for all of their members, um, all of their members are going to have to be uh, creating 12% of their electricity, for example, from renewables by 2012, and that, that number keeps increasing. So you have an assured transition, an underpinning to the transition. But in a case like United States, you don't have that coming from the top. And I gave a talk, an international talk recently with five other countries, and I represented the U.S., on the energy policy. And the five other countries all talked about our top-down policy. In the United States, I said the policy is coming from the cities and the states. And the cities and the states are doing remarkable things. And we're beginning to get a de facto national policy forced on the administration by what the cities and states are doing. Just to give you one brief example. The, the law that allows you to plug your rooftop solar electric system into the utility and let your meter run backwards, making it more economic for you. The federal government still s refuses to support it, but 36 states have passed that law. So 14 states more, and you've got 50 states having passed a law even if the feds didn't. And you begin to get the picture. We're developing our renewable energy policy from the states, and we're getting an incredibly important legislative, business, and economic experience from what the states are doing. And in many cases, the states are being pushed by the cities or being led by the cities. California is wonderful. It's got wonderful policy, but San Francisco's policy is going to be even more aggressive than the states. And if San Francisco can pull it off, it pulls California along. And then the rest of the country can look at the high, high standards that California sets, and federal policies can be set at higher and higher levels with confidence. So they really go hand in hand. You really need both. They're going to build power plants coal-fired power plants, maybe even nuclear power plants, so long as they're customers. And if the cities and the states begin to have aggressive energy efficiency programs and aggressive use of locally available energy resources, they stop being customers. And when they stop being customers, we stop building the power plants. I can hardly fault the people who are building the power plants because the customers are there. I fault the customers. And that's where the change is really going to take place. I sit here with the absolute certainty that the directions that we're heading right now are extraordinarily dangerous for the world and are extraordinarily uneconomic. And I sit here with the absolute certainty that global warming and climate change are going to be hugely dangerous and costly issues in the nearer future rather than the longer term future. More and more evidence is coming to that. <clears throat> and I sit here in the absolute certainty that we have the ways out in environmentally and economically benign and attractive methods. Energy efficiency, acceleration of the renewable energy transition is good for all economies. It's good for the world. It's good for security. And I have the absolute certainty. I know that the resources are there. I know that this can be done economically. I just wish everybody else could know with the same certainty that I know. I've been in this field 32 years. I've got good basis on which I know this. I just wish everybody else could know it as well, or at least trust those of us who do. We're doing our best to get the word out. 